We've got 6 p.m. And the first thing on the agenda is the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first thing is correspondence, visitors, and public comment. Do we have any visitors or public comments online? We do not. Stephanie is online, so that gives us a form of fun. Mm -hmm. Rennick is here. And Rennick is here, so I will let him take over. Right, we just started and we are at agenda review, so I will let you take that on. All right, perfect. I have the pleasure of walking with that and be used Um so I read agenda review. Um, I didn't know if there was an appetite to move the presentation before admin reports, or if everyone's good with that. That is fine with me. That makes sense. If everybody's here for skin Yeah, yeah. So I agree. Are you, is everyone here for This is what I've got. <laughs> uh, that's the only thing that I have. So we're going to move that up to move uh, after approval of minutes. Yes. Okay. We already did a uh, public comment, correct? Yep. All right. Awesome. All right. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for October 22nd? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All right, uh, in favor of approving the minutes for October 22nd, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 So, Don is not online, is he? No. Motion carries 6 uh, 0. All right. Julie, you want to introduce what we have for MBU tonight? Yes. Well, Sarah Gates, who's our student services coordinator, special ed coordinator here at MBU, is also one of the. Um, Junior class advisor. Junior, she's a junior class advisor, thank you. And with that comes skit night preparation, which I know has been taking up a lot of time. So we were discussing what we thought for having some students come, and it just seems timely. And so I will let Sarah introduce the students that she's brought with her, and I will attempt to get your My slide. very your, short slideshow. Your so. very short slideshow on there. So, um, yes, so uh, Skit Night is um, next Thursday and Friday um, for anyone who wants to swing in. I think it's called The Greatest Show on Earth, um, according to Jean Gagne. So um, I have with me three uh, juniors today, um, Aliyah Palquette, Shane Bushy, and uh, Max Wagner. Um, two have done, I'm trying to think of, Max, you joined us last year, right? So. Um, Aliyah and Shane have both done um, Skit for the last three years, and Max joined us last year, and so this is his second year. Um, so I've asked them to just kind of share a little bit about their favorite part of Skit, um, why they decided to join, um, and I'll let them kind of share. And then I have some funny pictures from, um, I think the pictures that I chose uh, show what happens freshman year and how it evolves and hopefully <laughs> um, gets better as we get older. So. I'm Aaliyah. Like she said, I have been doing this for now three years. Um, one of my favorite parts is probably starting from freshman year, being able to look forward to the next years, trying to get better, and still competing. We haven't won yet, yet, but looking forward to doing better 
and the food is great. <laughs> And it's really nice to be able to bond with people, even if you're doing your own grade, even on opening night, like you're spending time with other people, and it's a really good bonding experience. Um, my favorite thing about skit night is the teamwork involved and getting close with your classmates. I think it's a good way to just bring everybody together. It kind of just it sets the tone for like a good, you know, you just get close with all your classmates. I think it's it's really good. That's my favorite. Uh, I think it's my favorite part is getting together and trying to make something that will make the community laugh and mm -hmm. just have a good time. Perfect. So I don't know if you mind, Julie. Um, so Skit Night has been around, I think, since the start of MVU. Um, and so basically, the challenge is um, each grade has to um, create a, an original skit um, that encompasses as many students that want to uh, that want to engage with that. I think we've had 35, 30. We've had between 30 and 35 students just for the junior class. Um, the sizes vary for the classes, um, but we tend to have quite a quite a, a big crew. Um, we and then there's a competition. So uh, each night there's three judges: uh, Thursday night, and Friday night, and then. Uh, they announce the winner on Friday night. Um, so if you want to, so this next picture, oh, uh, that's just the judging. Um, there we receive points for all kinds of different things. Um, so we try to be mindful of some of this <laughs> um, as we create the skit, but really um, I think Max said it well when he said that it's really about just having fun and making the crowd laugh. Mm -hmm. um, when the students get off the stage, normally it's, oh my gosh, did you hear everyone laughing? That was great. Um, so that's, I know there's all kinds of other pieces to that, but really it's making the crowd laugh. How do you pick your judges? Oh, that's a question for Ms. Gagne. <laughs> we don't get to know who the judges are ahead of time, so. <laughs> she does try to pick alumni. Yes. MVU alumni. Yeah. And then if you go to the next. Um, so this is one of the pictures from uh, our freshman year. We attempted to do a kick line. Um, and this, for me, is um, kind of the trying to be a class advisor for freshmen in a picture. Um, <laughs> so we have everyone going in different directions, um, but still trying to work together. <laughs> so um, that's we did a, a kind of a county fair theme um, our freshman year and then the next picture is just another um, kind of scene from that students um, also paint all of the background we get four flats um, and the junior class is very lucky we have lots of really great artists um, so our flats and our props and our sets always look really great um, and then our last one here is you know we're a little bit more coordinated this is from last year um, and so every skit has to have a group dance um, which is just part of the part of the joy um, and so each year they get better and better um, and I'm really excited about the chances this year uh, they've been working really hard so, um, and I think that's my, that last, is my last picture so. definitely can see question. the difference between the kick line <laughs> and the sophomore year yeah. the coordination yeah and this year it'll be even more coordinated I think this is a really great event for everything that you know you guys said about camaraderie and, and getting to know your classmates better in a different way. And I know both my kids participated, uh, but differently. My daughter uh, didn't care to be out front on the stage, but she liked to draw and she's you know good artistically. So she did a lot of the murals and stuff, and she you know was out there bringing stuff in and out and really enjoyed that. My son's more of a ham, and he wanted to be out front. Don't know where he got that from. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it only open to starting a freshman, right? Yeah. Least? Okay. Yeah. Because I, I have a seventh grader, and I, I feel like he would love this. Yeah. So. I think it's nice though, because I think that the seventh and eighth graders hear about it and they know mm -hmm. about it. So by the time they get to freshman year, they are super excited, and they, you know, and I. It was a little bit harder, especially for these guys as freshmen, because they were 
um, seventh and eighth graders during COVID. So spin night actually didn't happen for the times they were middle school. So I feel like at some point we, that was a little harder for our crew because they were like, wait, where do we start? What does this look like? How did like you know they had no concept of kind of what skit night was unless they had like older siblings or cousins or something. So, um, but I do, I love that some of the new theaters know about it and that they can get excited about it and participate their freshman year, so. Yeah. And many of them will go. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Thursday or Friday night. It'll yeah. be a packed house. A lot of alumni go too, right? Yes. Oh, it's packed. It's, it's packed. usually sold out on Friday night at least. And I think pretty, pretty close Thursday night, I think. It's yeah. a lot of people, like people around the theater, not even in seats, it's a lot. Yeah. New seats. Yeah. Yep, yeah. new seats. <laughs> we won't lose any this time. <laughs> Do you feel more comfortable this year, you know, if, if for those of you that aren't, you know, natural to the stage, right? So that you, does it feel like you've become, you've nurtured the, Ham part of yourself, so you're happy being up on stage and being silly with your friends. For sure. It's always it's always a little nerve like nerve wracking before you get on stage every year, but it's it's fun. It's like not like a it's like a fun nervous. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always fun. For sure. So it, it because of COVID, so as seventh and eighth graders, you guys weren't quite sure um, what prompted you to say, yeah, I'm interested in trying, you know, in being, you know. Participating with Sydney. <laughs> so Somebody drafted you? Friends, yeah, were like, come on, you got to do this with me. I want to do this, you got to do this with me. Or you just. I hey. <laughs> Personally, I remember my eighth grade year going with some friends, okay. and I was like, wow, I, I want to do this. It looks like a lot of fun. Because okay. you just see people being silly in themselves on stage, and it's, you, can, you can see them having a lot of fun. What brought you last year? Someone dragged you? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I think it's a lot like. Yeah, but if you're like somebody dragged you last year, you're yeah. doing it on your Are you doing it on your own yeah. this year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Do you notice that um, more kids, so freshmen, maybe a smaller number of students participating, and then it gets bigger as they become seniors? I think it or depends. I think, unfortunately, for juniors and seniors, there's a lot of competing factors. Um, so, you know, kids can start to drive, they can start to work. Um, so, I am very appreciative to the juniors because a lot of them have taken a lot of time off work right now. Um, so, I think it depends. I think ours, our crew has grown a little bit from freshman year to sophomore year, but then we also have lost some along the way. So, um, I think it depends. Well. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. We really appreciate it. It's like usually the best part of the board meeting is when we get students <laughs> to show up. Yes. Thank so you. thank you for well that. hopefully everyone can come and see these great guys on. What stage. age is it again? Next. Uh, next Thursday and next Friday at seven. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Oh. I'm an alumni and I participated, in, I hate to even say this, in front of other people. <laughs> I participated in my senior year, so it's like the second year in BU was formed. Wow. And we won. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we won. And so it was great. And, uh, but my kids have done it too, and I just think it's just such a great night. I mean, I just love, I, I, I always think it's hilarious whenever I go. And I just love the, the creativity and the things that the kids really come out with, you know, to, and things and like, you know, it's such a great experience for all of you, and, but we enjoy it too, so I just want you to go get them. <laughs> Not how supposed to have favorites, but you came here, so, <laughs> so good luck. Fingers crossed for you next week. Awesome. Well, thank you so awesome. much. Thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you Sarah. is the MVU and district office reports. I'll open it up to uh, MVU report. Does anybody have any questions for 
Jen, I see uh, you taking over for Dan tonight. Sure. Okay, well, yeah. I'll come to give Christy some company. Yeah. Dan is at the athletic leadership conference right. with John and some students. And I just wanted to comment on how wonderful it is that um, the students are getting out there in the community. Um, National Honor Society happened to set up right next to me in Halloween in the park. Mm. They were fantastic. It was great to see them there. They were engaging with everybody. And then just reading the report and seeing everything else they've been doing, it's just nice to see all the students out there engaging with others and enjoying it while they're doing it. I will say the, uh, the Halloween drive through was uh, a lot of fun. So I did that and my kids were pretty freaked out and they, they took it, uh, they did a good job. They did a good job. So how did that idea come about? Oh, it's been a long time. It used to be a walk through the woods, kind of pre-COVID, it was yeah. a walk along the cross-country trails. And then I think the drive-through evolved during COVID, COVID. because we I couldn't so have, the, have it quite the same way. So that stuck. I think people liked it better. Yeah. Maybe slightly less scary. Slightly less say, scary. The, the one in the woods was very scary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. It was <laughs> terrifying, actually. I mean, they tried for this one. They had like a chainsaw out, and like, one girl was taking a little dolly and popping the head off. And we were getting into it. So. Creativity. Yeah. yeah, I was happy to see the, uh, the SRO parked at the bear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> they have fun doing it. Um, I did want to ask on the report, um, I know it's, uh, you know, October's a busy month and stuff. Is there anything else you want to add that wasn't in the report, some things that are maybe going on that you want to bring up to us? Um, there are a couple things coming up that just didn't make this deadline, um, and I'll put it in the next one, the October middle school students on a roll didn't, didn't make it in. Um, the middle school's going... The eighth grade is going to the Northwest Techn the um, NCTC. Northwest Career and Technical. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I fall back to the old. I always want to put a W old name. in there. I know, I, I do too. Um, next week, they're going. Um, the one team will go in the morning, one will go in the afternoon to tour that site. Um, NCTC has been here once already and has talked about their programs, and then they'll our kids will go and visit. Um, there's also a virtual meeting coming up. I don't remember the date, Jen, that you're going to do. Um, on the kids. 20th, VSAC yeah. sponsors a Career Connections virtual panel that we're going to have a small group of middle schoolers take part in. It's um, designed for middle schoolers. Um, and we're going to test it out this year and see if it's something we want to scale up. I think they have someone from healthcare mm -hmm. and a couple other different fields mm -hmm. to just engage with questions. Um, I saw pictures from today, the National Arts Honor Society, Elaine, your comment reminded me of this, the National Arts Honor Society was downtown painting windows for the um, holiday season. I think they were at Bees on Broadway and the new restaurant oh, and they're I painting. I some pictures of that today. Yeah, yes. so that's, that's really neat. And mm -hmm. the whole group of them, there's probably 20, 25 students going down to do that today and I think tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow, we are hosting an exclusive showing of the Home of Raleigh at the Weldon Theater for yeah. students and families. We're really excited about that. Um, about a third of our tickets have been spoken for so, for so far, so we're gonna do another push for that over the next week. And then I think we'll have some remaining tickets for faculty and staff who are also very excited to see it. So that's really exciting. Will that be open to the public at, like, on a different night, or...? So, the, the Weldon is hosting a showing next week. I believe it's on Thursday, and they have it going in multiple theaters. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that advertised, that's what gave us the idea of doing one that was exclusively for MBU students and families. Um, so we're using uh, some of the Title I family engagement funds that we have mm -hmm. um, to uh, help pay for that. So we're excited. It should be a fun time. Okay, and I would add, I, I heard this last week, there was a discussion of some people who have some students in uh, another district down south, I think it was Essex, and they were talking about um, 
just sort of like the level of education and how uh, MVSD and some of the other schools are actually rising up as compared to what's happening. And I think it, uh, I think it talks to we are doing a lot of good things up here, and I think it's starting to to catch on a little bit that it's not just Chinook County where you get um, you can get the better education. So I think that's good. So thank you for that. Um, anything else for MVU? Steer Jen. Okay. Um, so the district office. Any questions or comments on any of the reports? We have a few uh, directors here. We got Kosha online. So uh, Julie, I did want to say I like the video that you put in the report. I thought that was pretty good. That was. Along. Um, Absolutely. Has JR put that on? I asked him to make sure that we get it on there. I'm not sure if it's up yet, but um, I do want to make sure that it gets on our. We, Laura and JR and I have been talking a lot about what the look of that budget page will be. Yeah. Something. Our, our website is not great for having video embedded at the top, yeah. um, which is one of the things I don't like, but. Um, I, I do want to get that right at the top because I think it's really, uh, I mean, I really appreciate Vermont Public putting it out. Yeah, I, I thought it was um, a good way of explaining a very confusing uh, budget educational system. Mm -hmm. And did everyone get a chance to watch it? Yeah, and um, I've actually shown it to a few people and I think it, <clears throat> something about animation, it's like you can watch it and you can stay focused for a couple minutes, but um, that's good to have out there. It is there on the awesome. front, so that's good. So, so that's great. I was happy to see that. Um, Kosha, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the literacy coaches. And if you could just kind of cover, so are we at a good amount for literacy coaches? Do we need more? Could, could we potentially not have as many? Like, where are we with that? So we are in a really good, lucky position right now. We have a literacy coach in each of our buildings. And like I mentioned in my report, at Franklin, we don't have a full-time literacy coach, but Bree Trainer is their interventionist. And 20% of her time, she is the literacy leader in the building. So we are in a really good position right now in terms of literacy coaches and they do a fantastic job in supporting teachers in teaching, reading, writing, word study. Um, so we are in a good place right now, and we really use uh, those positions to help not just elevate the instruction in the schools, but we also work as a district team. So that really helps us to make sure we have consistency across the district as well as we have the vertical alignment as students go from uh, kindergarten up to 12th grade. And, and just for my own knowledge, so the literacy, whether it's math or literature, the coaches, they really work with the teachers, right? Yes, yeah. Their job is really to work with teachers and help teachers in anything that they would need support in, whether it's uh, conducting assessments, interpreting data, uh, whether they need something to be modeled in the classroom as far as instruction is concerned. Um, they do a lot of the unpacking of uh, units. For example, this year in K6, we have a new uh, program that we are implementing. So they help teachers to unpack what the unit is going to be about, how to teach that, how to really focus on the important things. And then at MVU, as you have heard, Miranda has been spearheading their whole uh, focus on morphology. So they take a leading role in helping administrators to uh, come up with a professional development plan that would help support the work in that building. How's the feedback from the uh, teachers? Um, overall, I mean, I've heard spontaneously from new teachers that they feel more supported in our district than they have in previous jobs because uh, we have established literacy and math coaches in each of our buildings. And, you know, when you're new, uh, whether you're a new teacher or new to the district, 
um, you wonder who to go to, right? If you have something that you uh, have a question about. So they really do a good job of uh, developing those relationships with our new teachers and then supporting them in whatever they really need. So um, I hear nothing but good things about the work that they do. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm I'm really interested to see how like that goes this year and kind of tying that into the student outcomes. So, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so I did have a question for student services. Anya, how are you? Hi, how are you? Um, so the part where it came to the homeless students. Um, do we have any numbers on that? Like how many? homeless students we have, how many we're serving, kind of like how that works, because it's one of those things where we, we read it and it's, you know, it's a reality for a lot of students. So if you kind of maybe dive a little bit more into that and what we're offering. Yeah. Well, honestly, Wendy is our homeless liaison, so she would have the current data specific to that. Um, typically in a given year, maybe we ebb and flow from like 15 students, like around 15, sometimes less, sometimes more, but it kind of, you know, again, it's one of those moving numbers, but I would, I guess that's maybe where we're at, but I don't have that, that number in front of me. Okay. Jen, would you, would you know, like, where we have that? I think we've had a high of 20, but we're not that high now. Okay. But it really has to do with the degree of impact to the family and the disruption of the students' life so that we want to make sure that their education is really stable for them. So are some of the services that we provide, is it, it's really just when they're here, what we can do for them, right? We, we can't do much more, right? Like, and I know it must vary between all different scenarios, but. We definitely connect families with the resources that are out there, places that they can access resources. Um, the federal law and, and where we really focus is ensuring that kids are enrolled immediately. They may not have paperwork with them, but we make sure that kids have stable enrollment. We make sure that they are fed all meals. Um, that's less of an issue now that we have universal meals, but it used to be something that was important to make sure it got signed off so that there was never inter in any interruption. And then arranging with the district where they're living right now. Um, between the two districts to make sure that students are being transported to and from school. Did I miss something, Tanya? You used to be the homeless liaison right. as well. I'm just thinking, you know, there's there's often a question around, you know, what what items or what things yeah. can we provide? And so sometimes there is an opportunity to provide backpacks or, um, you know, personal care packages, that sort of thing. Um, we do have some money that allows for that. We've written grants in the past for that sort of thing. Um, but right now, I don't. I, I think we've found that that hasn't been as much the need, right, the, the stuff. Um, but we do have an ability to access that yeah. if we needed to. We have some backpacks that we have, we got a small grant a few years ago or something um, came through that we applied for and we collected Materials and supplies and that sort of thing, but, but minimally, right? It's not a big. Mm. Thing. Um, we do still have the wellness kits as well from the after school grant funding from last year, so principals can always submit a request for hygiene products and whatnot. And we can create like a little wellness kit for any, really any students in need, but it's something that Wendy and I often make sure that our, our families are aware that those products are available. Yeah, the, the only reason I wanted to just kind of highlight that is just, um, you know, we talk a lot about budget, we talk a lot about, you know, what we cut, and we forget that there's kids relying on school. Absolutely. You know, and they don't have a lot else, so I think it's important to talk about that that's, that's something, obviously, I assume it's mainly in the high school, um, that, you know, we offer and we try to do our best, and there's a lot of kids with a lot of difficult situations, so... The fact that they can come to school and have a good environment and get services, I think, is really important. So, well, if you maybe could, if Wendy, next time, she could. A number. Yeah. Just, well, yeah. yeah, elaborate number, just kind of a little bit more like what we do and all that. That'd be, that'd be great. 
Um, uh, Beth Ann, since I see you here, I did want to ask about the Catalyst program and kind of elaborate on that. I saw it's kind of tied into some of the student outcomes, like how many kids you have signed up and what the program about. Yeah, so it's uh, thanks to the state after school grant that we received earlier this year, and it just started as of today, opened up, and it's really more of a drop-in space for students that may have interest in, we're talking about this in aspirations, Jen. Um, career readiness, uh, job coaching, anything like that, it's really just a drop-in space for that. So we've got somebody kind of assigned to doing some research, keeping a job board open, making sure that our internship opportunities are front and center, um, career coaching, all of that kind of stuff. So it just kind of opened today, but Becca, our MBU site coordinator, has been talking with guidance counselors and making sure that we're getting the word out there. So we assume that as word spreads that this is a resource that's available to kids, um, we're hoping that they'll, stop, they'll start dropping by. Um, and we're doing sort of a, we're trying to wrap a bunch of events into one that, that's why, okay, this is selfishly why I'm here tonight, is I want to invite you all to our grand opening next month, which is right before the board meeting, right over there. So if anybody wants to scoot in 15 minutes early and drop in and see what we're up to, that would be amazing. I know that our staff and some of, we have several teams that are going to be there representing the work they've done in our program. So I think they'd be really psyched to have some fancy board members dropping by. We'll have pizza if that wasn't enough of an incentive. Um, but really the idea of the event is to kind of highlight what the resources are as well as having some of our previous teen interns, current teens working with us in uh, kind of breakout work group sessions talking about what they think can be better, what resources they think they need, um, as well as having some of our adult partners, some of the ones from the summer, um, Habitat for Humanity, Lake Carmi, um, some of those adult representatives kind of talking about what they thought worked from the internship program this summer and what we can do to strengthen it for when we launch again in January. Um, I'm not sure where this graphic came from, but the date is wrong on the flyer I'm seeing right now, <laughs> so ignore the flyer and just listen to my words which are uh, Tuesday, December 3rd, uh, right before your board meeting. So we'd love to have you here, and we've also got some professionals from Vermont After School coming in to chat with our teen interns and talk about what it's like to work in Franklin County and what the state of Vermont can do to better support those initiatives. So we're really excited about it. Well, thank you. So Tuesday, December 3rd. Correct. Not Four Monday, six, December yeah. 4th. Not Monday, December 4th, which is not a real day. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Not in 2024, anyway. I, I will take credit for it, I, I, but I have not ever seen this. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, Pictures are cool. Yes, they are. It's a great flyer outside of the state. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, that, that is kind of, I don't know if it was mentioned, I don't know, Pierrette or Jana or Joanne, if you gave any feedback from the PSBA conference that we were at. Um, but one of the things that was talked about there, which Joanne, you brought up, which is um, it is being kind of pushed that right now with a difficult budget year to talk about the good things we're doing and to keep reinforcing, you know, things that we're doing that tie into student outcome or like serving the community and to just keep kind of reinforcing those right now, um, given there's a lot we don't control. So anytime I see stuff like that, I want to make sure we highlight it, get it in the minutes, so that if anybody goes back and watches, they're, they're aware that, you know, the good work is still happening. So, thank you. Um, the last thing I had from the report is just, congratulations, Bonnie. You got your MBA. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, how was it? Hard, easy? She's bored. <laughs> oh. I am a little bored now, yeah. This was like my first weekend that, I mean, you know, bored, but um, yeah, I mean, it was tough. I, you know, it was two years ago that I went back and I have two teenagers and a full-time job. And uh, so it was tough, but worth it. I mean, it was definitely good. And I think I appreciated it more doing it as an adult than, you know, it was, there was a 19 year difference between receiving my bachelor's and receiving my master's, so. It's always harder to go back to school later when, you know, 
you have kids and you have a full-time job and it's not like anything stressful ever happens no so, no easy peasy you know. yeah, your job <laughs> well anyway congratulations thank you very much um anything else for district office well, I see that um, winter athletic contracts have gone out, but uh, sounds like there's still open coaching positions for winter. Just two, two. middle school girls. Oh, okay. So that's it. So it's actually a big um, improvement over years past of how many coaches we have returning. And you also state that hiring of open positions. So we are still actively looking for people to fill current positions that are open. Um, yes, and we also, you know, are in a point of having turnover now as well with some of our hourly positions. So filling oh. filling positions doesn't really ever stop. <laughs> but, um, you know, some of our, our professional positions we won't likely end up filling okay. this year. And we've, you know, there's all the plans in place and everything, so those positions are fine okay. to not be filled but we are still actively filling hourly positions uh, we started the year with a couple still open um, here at MVU and at Swanton and then we've had a little bit of turnover so we'll work to fill those as we can and uh, just a plug to anybody listening that we are in a pretty desperate need of long-term substitutes so if anybody knows anybody who you know has a teaching license and is sitting around doing nothing with it, we would love to have them. They can pick a grade. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you to the directors. You can stay the whole meeting if you like, um, but if you want, you guys can go. Thank you. Um, all right. Next agenda item is. Budget draft one. Uh, Laura, if you'd like to bring up the slides. Sure. Julie, I don't know if you actually want to start yes, with your slides. But you're going to have to yes. Maybe. advance the slides for me this time. So I just wanted to sort of set the stage a little bit as we're coming forward with our first draft. Um, I know all of you remember last year, about a third of school districts did not pass budgets on town meeting day. Um, it was September, I think it maybe have even been October before the last budget in Vermont passed. Um, our district budget passed on the third attempt in the end of June. Um, and as a result, you know, it was a challenging year. We spent a lot of time looking at every expense, and um, part of the challenge was that it was uh, an opportunity to increase our, um, we were receiving more revenue uh, from the state based on a change in weights and a long-term weighted average daily membership. So we were fortunate to pass our budget uh, it was a good budget, um, and yet we still we didn't gain a ton from our our uh, count of long-term weighted average daily membership, and we're still one of the, below the 25th percentile in terms of spending per per pupil in Vermont. And here's just that quick visual. This is an updated one. Um, we are the red near the bottom. The two blue below are, are Franklin Northeast two districts, that's us. The black above, up there is the app state average, way up there is the state average. County, right? That's the county average, that's the state average. And then all the way up there, the red one is Maple Run, spending per um, student. And so, you know, I think it's just important to point out to our community that our district provides a great deal for our students um, and at a low cost per student. Among, you know, we're the 12th largest district in the state and we're spending at the bottom, near the bottom. Well, I think that particular graph, um, when matched with sort of like, again, depending on how much stock you take in some of those rankings, I think it's just, again, it shows we're, we're quite conservative with what we spend. Um, but we are getting results for it. So. I think one of the things you mentioned that you know we were 
getting more revenue because of the state changes. But they also changed rules in the middle of our they certainly budgeting did. process, which really hampered not just us, but all school districts and probably a large reason why a lot of them failed. I'm not a big fan of the expression, building the plane while flying it, yeah. but it was it's really the only one I can think of. Um, and, and felt like they were tearing apart the plane while flying it and then duct taping it back together a little bit, which was really hard. The doors, fall off. the doors were falling <laughs> off. <laughs> Definitely felt that way. Absolutely. So I just wanted to share with the board and, and the community a little bit about how we um, make decisions uh, about the budget and the kinds of talking points that we go through. So Laura and I and, and Bonnie as well, when we're talking about staffing, meet with all the directors and all the building principals and we review staffing under all kinds of various categories because 80% of spending in Vermont and 80% of our budget approximately, it's probably in the high 70s, but is, is, is staffing. So we really look at the number of students served, the kind of need of the school in particular, whether it's uh, curricular needs of a high school where you have various offerings that you want to ensure that we have, or whether it's the demographics of the community and the number of interventionists that are needed or the, the, to support the students who are struggling. Um, and then we are looking more and more at outcomes and the method of service delivery. Are we doing the same thing we've always been doing? And should we be looking at doing things a little bit differently? Because if the outcomes are not moving, maybe we shouldn't keep doing the same thing. We, I want to stress that we use attrition. Attrition is our friend. Um, when we talk about allocating or reallocating staffing to meet student needs, we really look at vacancies and retirements or people who are just not returning, and then we examine the need for that position in, within the whole system. We've started to designate targets of what we would like to see, um, and then we want to move strategically step by step toward those targets as a district. Here, here's the reality. If I have a position here that I think I might not need, that person, if they're not the most senior teacher in that category, and most of our teachers are under teachers, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily have that teacher leave next year. It would be a different teacher in a different school. So you really have to be specific to the type of program and um, use attrition. It also is better for culture, because we are also trying to always retain and support our teachers. We also will have, you know, I can't say this enough, effective delivery of services. How many students do interventionists see? How big are the groups? How are you seeing kids all day? How, what is the, you know, and we've, I've just spent several weeks examining all the schedules of every teacher in our district and um, doing some calculation with a Laura and a spreadsheet, um, you know, our, our, our interventionists are working with a lot of kids. So that was a really relieving thing, for example, for me to be able to see. I wasn't surprised by it, but it, it's one of those things that's important for us to really ensure. And the intent really is to make prudent decisions over time to get to where we want to be so that we really have good uh, student staff ratios, and it's not just about ratios. The state likes to talk about ratios. It's about what, it's, it's also about the need of the school, and those two things intersect. So if we have a school that has a really high poverty rate, that has a lot of agency involvement, that has a lot of challenges, they're going to need more resources. So it's not just about numbers. Um, and so the real point is we don't want just efficiencies, we want efficient and effective. We will have to find that balance. So it's really my focus over time, the last several years, and MVU I think has experienced a lot of that, is we sit down, we look at everything and see, is this where you want your resources? Is this the best place for it? What would your dream be if you could take this position and move it somewhere else? What would that be? So we do a lot of that because it really moves, and over time that's really moved MBU in a really good place with its resources. 
and we're doing that with all of our schools. Thanks, Laura. I just wanted to, because you're going to hear a lot. You know, Megan tonight is at the Commission on the Future of Education. This is a slide that they've shown, uh, I'm sure, there, but they've also shown it at the Listen and Learn tours that I've been to a couple of those input sessions at this point. It's hard to see, but hopefully you'll be able to see it on the camera. Um, in Vermont, um, our ratio of staff to student is the highest ratio in the country. Um, we are 51st in terms of the lowest number of adults, uh, students per adult. So whichever way you look at it, we're either number one with staffing or the lowest with the student ratio count per staff. And if you look, it's interesting to see the national average, which is about 7.45 students per adult. Um, and Vermont is, am I doing it backwards again? Is it, I apologize. I always misspeak and say students per staff when I mean staff, staff per student. Per but the US average is 7.45, Vermont is 4.4. .4. Uh, but if you look at New England in general, we're a lot closer there. Maine is 4.8, Massachusetts is 6.9, New Hampshire is 5.5. I think New England uh, in the Northeast has pretty good outcomes. But you can see that in, in the Northeast in general, the, the average is 6.1. And on the right, you'll see the decline in, in student enrollment across the state, which is what so that, a lot so that's of people enrollment are talking about. I can't see. I know. This is enrollment, and the red one is employees. Yeah. So less students, more employees. Yes. Yeah. Over time. <clears throat> That is going to be, uh, depending on what happens with the legislature, the conversation. Absolutely. We've been having the conversation of um, just our overall education budget total mm -hmm. and then the number of employees. Um, and then they always do add that with student outcomes, mm -hmm. and, right? Because the other side of it is sure, but are the outcomes meeting right. that? Um, which is why I think we do a pretty good job in terms of our outcomes, and I think. Um, I think that needs to be a very big highlight. Absolutely. Um, especially post um, high school. I think that's, to me, that's what I constantly hear. Like, okay, if we're spending the money, where are they getting when they Absolutely. Is it preparing them better? Are they getting the jobs? Are they getting into the schools they want? Um, but a lot of this we can't control. And I think as a district, we're already, we don't spend. No, we don't. And I, I think the importance of showing this is so that we can then, for the next slide, we can talk about what we are doing. So we want to make sure our community knows that we're being responsible and we're not contributing. Um, for example, our enrollment has not been declining dramatically. Um, I just wanted to note there is, um, you need to take into consideration here also, though, the additional things that schools are being asked to do. Yes. Well, and that's another thing that the state is looking at. It's not the only in impact, but it's one of them. It's not, we're not looking at, when we talk about staff, that is everything from custodial staff to support staff, secretaries in the school, behavioral staff is one of the largest increases in, um, in schools, uh, staff to support students with significant mental health challenges that, to help them stay and remain in school. Those are some of the larger increases across the state. Um, so it's typically not how many classroom teachers you have. One of the things, so our data, our trends, are that we have decreased our enrollment by half of a percent overall, or 0.2, negative 0.2, if it's, you're looking just at K-12. Um, that's over five years, that's seven years of data. Um, our average staff to student ratio is just under five. Um, it's much, there's much, um, we're in a much better position, particularly in uh, Swanton and at MBU. Um, our ratio for leaders to students is below the state and national average, so we have 0.8 administrators for uh, every 100 students, and the state average is 1.4. 
uh, the Champlain Valley region is 1.2. So we're very um, cautious and conservative with our uh, administrative and their workload. Um, and really, again, the biggest need increase we're seeing in staffing or have seen over the past several years around behavioral systems to respond to and prevent um, the behavioral challenges that are interfering with students' education. Our average class sizes, the education quality standards asks for a maximum in K-3 maximum average in K-3 of 20 students per classroom and for grades 4 and through 12, 25. Um, as you can see, I just want, thought it was important to show that our elementary schools have pretty good uh, an MBU, middle school in particular. Um, we have 17.85 in Franklin, average class size, 16.85 in Highgate, 16.7 in MBU, uh, 19.17 in Swanton uh, and MBU High School is at 13 but that includes some real specialty classes where there are very few students um, and we have if you look at the major classes they tend to have more 17 18 kids in them each but we have a lot of offerings so those are conversations that we have through attrition is what is the balance of offering versus the teaching load of the staff that we do have? So for the elementary schools, that is your the average class size is K through 12, or K yes. through six, I mean? In the elementary, yes. K through six. So, but you stated that we're supposed to be below 20 for K through three? The average K three is uh, supposed, to, under the ed quality standards is 20 or below. And we do hit 20 sometimes. We have a couple of classrooms in Franklin that have 20. Um, and, you know, it gets tricky. If you have, Highgate has two classrooms per grade, and we have 19 kids in kindergarten. But it, if we were to go to a third classroom, it, it's too small. Yeah. Right? So 20 is fine, but you just need to make sure that you have good teachers who are really skilled and know how to manage a classroom of, t of 19, 20 students. Um, you know, once you get below a certain size, the interactions with students, the learning actually suffers. Do teachers in K to three, do they normally have a helper or someone in the classroom with them? We typically have the most support in K um, and then in first grade. Um, we don't assign somebody to every classroom in most of our schools we just don't have the staff we have too many kids with needs and even if it wasn't about the cost really it's just finding people who, who are able to do it so the majority of our folks are with kids who have some level of need for support um, but most of those are in the lower grades because as kids age they for the most part are able to regulate themselves more most of those kids are falling under um, special education programs. Mm -hmm. So next steps, we're meeting with administrators this week and next week, um, looking at ratios at their building level, looking at their staffing, what they expect uh, to see for changes. Um, we're looking at vacancies and talking about those. Um, looking at caseloads for specialists, you know, we've always talked about how we, you know, a special educator leaves before school starts and we can't find a replacement. So what does that caseload look like? We want to make sure that everybody is able to do their job well and that people have the resources that they need and we feel really good about that right now. Um, but we don't want lots more people to leave. Uh, we feel like we're in a good, a good place there. Um, and we'll continue to look at attrition and make targeted decisions um, to determine equitable staffing patterns that meet the needs of our schools. Um, and in December, you're going to hear from Tanya, Wendy, and Sarah. Again, I think they're going to do a presentation. They're going to talk more. We're going to do a deeper dive into special ed and look at the demographics of the 
uh, of the need in our community, what kinds of disabilities do we have, and tie that in, in ways to the budget. So whatever our staffing patterns look like, what are our costs for students that are educated in our schools, what are our costs for students who need to be educated outside of our schools, um, and what does that look like. So I think that's an uh, opportunity to hear from them and to do a little bit more of a deeper dive. We'll talk about contracts as well as staffing. Um, we'll also have with there, because there's a revenue piece of that too, right? Absolutely. And that'll be included. Sure. Julie, I added a slide about the budget informational meeting, so maybe we would pick a new date. Yes. So I did get confirmation from the state's attorney's office that the informational meeting, because we are a completely Australian ballot um, vote, uh, that we are able to have that informational meeting up to 30 days before a town meeting. So I think given uh, school vacation, given feedback we've received from the community, the number of who, people who vote early, uh, you know, that, gee, I wish I had this information three weeks ago, you know, um, we can hopefully do our informational meeting earlier and then have it videoed and have, you know, the full meeting and maybe a little sound bite, shorter video clips as well that can go out so that people are getting that information in time for town meeting. But yes, especially with early voting, I think it's important to take advantage of that. I threw out some dates, two of them. If you, I'm wondering if people want to stick to a Tuesday for the informational meeting. That's what we've done traditionally. Two of those happen to be board meetings already. So when's vacation break? Is it the week of the 18th or is it the oh, week after? It's the last, the last one I put after. So the other one that's not a board meeting is the 11th? The 11th. But do we want it on a board meeting night? We have a shorter board meeting because usually we have it at 7. Do we usually have the informational meeting yes. starting at 7? So if the... So we're here. So what day is town hall going to fall on? Like what is the closest? It's always a Tuesday. It's the 4th. The 4th. Yeah. So then the closest board meeting 30 days before would be the February 4th. That would be the last one. The 3rd of February is past is 30 days so we can any feelings about I think the <coughs> kind of cutting it close so I, I think given the information and, and people have requested it earlier uh, either the 11th which is not a board meeting or we can kind of make a shorter board meeting and do it on the 4th thoughts any concern about having all the information and prepared by the fourth? I think February 11th looks good. Okay. I mean, we'll have to have adopted a budget and had every, every, everything printed, et cetera, by, uh, by the end of January. January. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I hope that is helping. But, that, but we still put together for the informational meetings, slides and everything. Yeah. I just want to make sure we have time. Thank you. Um, JR and I are already meeting, trying to make sure that we're front-loading a lot of that work, and OpenGov is helping with that, so shouldn't be an issue. So the 18th, am I hearing the 18th feels a little late? Yeah, it was late to me. Late. I, does. I think to me it should be either the fourth or the eleventh if we're going to do the same night. Mm -hmm. So it's up to how others feel. Can we uh, wait until our next meeting when mm -hmm. we have a full four? Yeah, I'm good with yep. that, Peter. Yep. Um, you can just say it'll either be the fourth or the eleventh, Julie, and then we mm -hmm. can discuss next meeting. 
kind of like the idea of just having it almost as its own thing to just really focus in on. Um, but yeah, we'll discuss it when uh, we have the rest of the numbers here. Because it also has to match up with people's schedules. All right. All right, so uh, Laura suggested this. I thought it was great um, to just add some, like, I guess as we go through different drafts, uh, some of the finance committee discussion and input ahead of um, the drafts. So our last uh, finance committee meeting, um, we went over we went over the draft. Uh, we also went over the health insurance. So the increase, uh, it's less than anticipated, it's still high. So it's 11.6, correct? 11.9. 11.9, I know a lot of, <clears throat> we've been fearing that maybe we're gonna be up closer to like 19, 20%. So not as bad as we thought, but still entirely too high. Um, Laura had showed me, what's that program called again, the new one? That Open Gov. Open Gov. Um, don't ruin the surprise. I'm sharing with them too. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I won't ruin the surprise. But basically, health insurance is costing us a lot as a district, and we don't have any control over it. So that's something that should be talked about. Um, there is agreed upon a percentage that we're using as a placeholder uh, for non-union staff. Um, Professional unit staff is currently under negotiations, so that's something we can talk about in executive session if we do. Um, and then focus on the impact on students, uh, students and success. So that's very much what Julie was talking about before, which is you know, is it efficient? Is it effective? Uh, and some of the things that we're going to talk about in future meetings is revenue. Um, very interested to see sort of like that revenue breakdown where that's coming in. We want to share that, and then a more inflations and savings. Um, and then we also reviewed the uh, bus cameras, and we'll talk about that later when it comes to the action. Now the fun part. Um, so you have a link here in your budget development book that I'm going to be keeping again all throughout the cycle for, for your reference um, <coughs> to the draft. The draft does look a little bit different if you haven't had a chance to look at it. It's now being populated from OpenGov. Um, we talked to the Finance Committee a little bit about the format um, and how we've condensed some of the information. Um, we, we can still provide the, all of the information. We're building the budget school by school and then the centralized pieces as well. And we break it down by fund just like we did before. So general fund, special ed, grants, those kinds of things. But in this, what we're going to be reviewing, we, we're rolling up the funds. We're rolling the schools together. We're just comparing year to year. Um, and then we're rolling up the objects, such as like salaries and benefits and purchase services and things like that. Um, I will provide the link in the uh, in the the uh, workbook as well to to the full the full draft of the budget. I just think it's sometimes um, difficult to have discussion when we have so much information, and sometimes we hone in on small pieces of information or maybe they can be mis misunderstood or misrepresented and we don't kind of lose track of the bigger picture. So I think it'll be helpful um, to use this new document. Um, what else was I say? Uh, overall, we have a $1.4 million increase in this draft. Um, you can see the numbers there. We just up over 50 million for fiscal year 26. Um, some of the notes or things to um, consider and some Renick has already talked about, but the union professional staff is currently under negotiations, so we probably will have a conversation in executive session about that. Union support staff, um, negotiated increases are already in place, so that's a step increase for, for all of the support staff, so we've applied that. Non-union staff for draft one budget purposes only, we've included 3% for um, non-union support and professionals and administration just to be consistent as far as the draft for future conversation. Um, benefit increases, as Renick stated, um, health, insur health insurance is at 11.9. That's what Visbit filed under, that we don't know if that's going to be what is accepted, but that's what's been filed. We won't find out what's accepted for a couple of months. Um, dental is going to be flat, and mo most other benefits are also going to be flat or maybe slightly reduced. Um, another thing to note is um, when you look through here, you'll notice, and I put the code there just because it'll help you if, if you see it later on, but the HRA expenses, which is a huge part of our benefit package, last year I made a big deal of saying that we had moved it into a centralized um, coding, so it wasn't following all the payroll pieces in every part of the budget. It just was easier to manage. 
in the new software, it follows the payroll. So you'll, it's, you'll notice a big um, reduction in the administration line, and that's the HRA. Um, it's so now back into salaries. Back into salaries, and it's following every position. Um, Vistors Healthcare, that's that um, contribution we have to make on every new teacher to the teacher retirement system. That line continues to grow and grow and grow every year, but we don't know what that number is going to be. It does increase every year. I think it was 1,400 and something. Um, Laura, is that one of the things that the Commission on the Future of Education is considering people a law have brought, change? People have brought it up. That's and it's, I think, yeah. something to advocate for because mm -hmm. it, it continues to be mm -hmm. an unfunded mandate. Yeah. Um, also, the Act 76, the child care contribution, that's a payroll tax of 0.44% on every single dollar that we um, spend on positions. Um, so, and we are currently, the, as the employer, um, bearing that burden. So that's a new, um, a new expense. Also in this draft, um, staff, FTEs, and vacant positions are, um, as Julie said, we're cur currently reviewing all of that, so by no means is what in this draft, just because of focus on salaries and benefits doesn't mean that's exactly where the staff are, are, is going to land as far as FTEs and positions. Um, but it does represent a reduction of about nine FTE from what we budgeted from last year. Um, again, we're still having all those conversations, and some of those reductions um, are because we could not find staff like SLPs, and so we've replaced them with contracted services. Um, and that's probably the next part of the budget that I'll bring when Tammy is talking about student support and things. I'll start adding those increases or decisions into the budget draft. So something like that would be a shift to another part of the budget? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll go from a 100 and a 200 to a 300 line. Um, and I did share some of the open gov um, capability and, and some of the um, online budget book that we're working on as we build the budget, which is theoretically by the time we get done building the budget, most of the work is done and then we're ready to market the budget. So it's really great. Um, let me just pull up. I want to show you an example of what we're talking about. toolbar is in the way and I can't. So just different things to take a look at. Um, this is a chart that represents um, just the salary and benefit increases over the last four years. So it represents what's in this budget draft that you're looking at. Um, you can see as I hover over some of these, you can see the amounts will pop in. But obviously, you know, health insurance just continues to grow and grow and grow. It's not just the salary pieces. Um, so if um, also, if we scroll down, you can very clearly see the increase over the years, just the salaries, this is the top line, and benefits. And you can see the new budget lines. And you can see that basically that makes up $35 million of our budget, just those two, those two pieces. Um, I have the capability to drill down in things also. Um, this is just a graphic um, that the software produces, and I can drill down on any, any piece of information that I want. But basically, this is a, the breakdown of the fiscal year 26 budget by object. So we can clearly see, again, that this is the benefit piece. This is the um, professional salaries and support salaries. That's $24 million. Um, and then all the, way, all the way across, obviously, the smallest lines being supplies. And this is debt service. So then what those will end up kind of turning into, along with some of the other graphics, is an online budget book. In, um, in the um, budget workbook, I've prov uh, provided links. So you can actually click on the links. And these are kind of live. I've published these. So when you click on the hyperlink, you can go right to some of these documents as well. But ultimately, they'll end up on the website. Um, so and these are drafts, but um, proposed budget draft one, we thought it was important to focus on student enrollment. Obviously, in MVSD, student enrollment has not declined. Um, in 22, we were at 1775, and now we're at 1813. Um, obviously, we also have an increase to our budget, so you can see that here. Um, last year, the 48, 909, 437. And now we're up to the 50 million, 334, 969. 
also you can I believe when you click on these tell me if it doesn't work but you should be able to just access and get right to the charts that I was referencing when I started so you'll be able to see um, and drill down on information that you might want to in the public to whatever level we want um, would also be able to do that in the online budget book which is great And this is just another example of another page that since we're talking about salaries and benefits, again, this is the graphic where you can see just the cost um, this year of $35 million for salaries and benefits. Um, out of that increase, or out of that number, 29.93% of it is the benefit piece, and 70.07% is the salary piece. But clearly we can see um, the impact of the benefits there will still remain uh, or will still uh, maintain different grids um, but we're able to drill down on information much easier so this again is just the salaries and benefits pieces and the increase this one I think is the one that Renick might have been talking about this is just the health insurance increase so if you look at this 5.7 million for health insurance now we're at 6.3 in the new year we have zero control over that other than how many staff we have so that's negotiated at the state. So I think that's really important to share. Um, and then again, we just have some grids. And then this is the health insurance with the HSA and the HRA, because like I said, that's another large part of our um, expenses. So you can see 6.4 million up to 7.1. I think a point we brought up at the meeting the other night too was when you look at this year's, the proposed budget compared to this year's budget, look at the increase in the insurance that's really the difference in the budget so really we're flat we haven't changed anything else it really is the insurance and, yeah. and you know even just having HRAs and HSAs and the, the amount that we need to have um, available for the predicted use it also is negotiated at the state level so it's not something that we have control of even locally and currently in this the state too yes the the percentage we totally no control correct the um hra traditionally our hras have been used at like between 65 and 70 percent it's dipped a little bit lower in one year but um in this budget i'm using 80 percent it's one of those things that if, you know I'm, we wait more of this year will go by we'll see where we are people have started to go back to the doctors and you know all of that so things are becoming more expensive a lot more prescriptions and stuff like that so um, but this draft does include 80% and we might be able to drop that down a little bit. <clears throat> I assume there's, um, is there any talks or discussions that you're hearing of, of adjusting that or changing that? It's part of the entire conversation. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the Commission on the Future of Education is aware that health care is a huge uh, factor in ed spending and but that's not just our insurance either it's also hospital costs and what the Green Mountain Care Board is doing so it's a really much bigger picture um, but those are all things that have a very big impact on our education spending and right now uh, negotiations of health care are frozen until when? Fiscal year 27. Fiscal year 27. So, that, so there isn't going to be a change in any uh, health care, whether it's the, the amount uh, paid by employees who's the first dollar paid in terms of reimbursement or what the percentage share between the employee and the employer. None of that will change till 27. And the thing about it is just that, you know, it just seems like to have brought that to the state level when they don't really have anything to negotiate in exchange for it, right? When we had it in the master agreement, we could say to the employee, well, if you pay, you know, 1% more, maybe we'll give we'll you a, this, an yeah. increase in your salary in return, and then you can move that way they have no leverage so so what are they going to say um you want to pay an extra one percent and they go not really and then you're done so this is it's not surprising it's frozen the whole structure of the statewide negotiations and that panel I forgot what they're called but that commission yeah. um is set up for 
no change to happen. Exactly. Because it's binding arbitration and last best offer, and you're not really no party is is um, rewarded for trying to do something different. The whole point of this change in health insurance that we had, I don't know, it's not quite 10 years ago now, maybe nine, um, was that we were having Cadillac program plans and the Affordable Care Act, they were no longer consistent with, and we actually have more Cadillac plans now than we did before. And um, they were really hoping to get people to have more skin in the game in terms of their use of health insurance and and you know they know you have to bear some of that cost up front therefore you're deciding do I need an MRI or do I not need an MRI am I gonna what kind of questions am I gonna ask my doctor about this test or that and this method which it, you know it's great as a consumer but it's not um, in any way reinforcing a more cautious use of health care or driving down the cost in any way. Yeah, a family plan, our contribution to a family plan is over thirty million, thirty thousand dollars That's one plan. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, it, it, and I think there was a time, too, when they tried to you know, offer different types of plans mm -hmm. and where you could, where you, I'm, I'm talking about as an employee, yes. you might be prone to it because they could save some money, money because it's obviously the employer pays more, but they also pay more of the high mm -hmm. premiums. But, you know, there is no movement to go towards that because they made no changes, so no incentives. I mean, it, it, it's just, it was really kind of just a wrong move. <laughs> I, I just don't know how to say it any differently, but. Well, yeah, it's, it's well, we just have to deal with what we have right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, just Laura, mm -hmm. one last thing on the functionality of this. So when I go to the links and then I, it goes to the um, pre-designated page, mm -hmm. you control the functionality, what you do and don't add it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that might be something that we can dive deeper in, like in a finance committee meeting, in terms of yeah. how deep we go mm -hmm. with what we share. And what yeah, we and we can tailor it to different audiences too, as far as what might be consumable, you know, okay. or the points we're trying to make. Yeah, I will say it's a work in progress. It's a, <laughs> we're we're learning a lot as we go, but it's, it's a great tool. I think it's a fantastic tool. And uh, uh, thank you to you and the team for a lot of work going into this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> See if it helps. Uh, uh, was that the last slide for I need to go back the draft? Here. Or was there another one? Hold on one second. I don't know if it's the last or at the end. Um, yes, that was my last one. Okay. Um, any other questions on uh, draft one? Off we go. Fast and Furious now. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Laura and Julie. And Laura, do you want to share the bus camera? Oh, yeah. yes. Sorry. Just next. stop. <coughs> yeah, so that will listen to our next agenda item, which is the bus cameras. Um, action. Uh, I closed it. Sorry. Luckily, we have Derek here. Derek's been doing the research for the past year on the various bus camera systems and their capability. I feel like I was able to answer most of the questions at the Finance Committee, but there were a couple, like what the channels meant, that we felt like we were, we were winging that one a little bit. So we've got our expert. There we go. There we go. Uh, so this is what we looked at the finance committee meeting. Uh, basically, the different options for um, how many cameras are cost installation. Um, the one highlighted in blue um, that is our recommendation to the full board. But either Laura or Derek, if you can kind of dive in and kind of explain what we're looking at, difference between three and eight channel and um, also, there's a, because uh, you had a recommendation too. 
Yep. Uh, so the, the channel thing is just the um, on the DVR itself. So the DVR is where the recording is for the cameras. Um, so all the cameras will feed, feed into the DVR. The channels uh, is just how many cameras can you have. So if it's a three channel, you can only have three cameras. If it's a five channel, you can only have five. So um, different um, vendors have different uh, kinds of DVR systems. They have you know, various five channels. Uh, 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 Safely, for example, has a six channel that they like to use. Um, so when we were looking at this, we were just uh, trying to think of future growth and um, you know, if there's ever a need for an additional camera or two, um, um, we were trying to build it out so that we had that flexibility. Uh, I will say of the vendors that I researched and talked with, Safely was the most responsive. Um, they were really quick to answer any questions. Um, and as noted, they are familiar with Terracell. They work with a neighboring uh, district. They have cameras that are installed in the buses already. So they're familiar with them. Um, so that was the recommended uh, vendor that we, we picked for the uh, camera setup. And also Terracell. They've agreed to install. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the negative numbers you see here is what the install price would be if they, did, if they were not installing. There's, I put your other points down here too, Derek. I don't know if. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I think you guys had some questions last time. So warranty is still valid if if they're self-installed. We're good there. Um, the cameras do record audio. We have the capability to blur out faces. So if we need to export video um, for privacy reasons, we can blur out other kids' faces so they're not exposed. Um, the one terabyte drive is just, that's part of the DVR system that uh, that size will give us enough uh, space to record 30 days of retention. Um, the oldest footage will be overwritten. Um, and they have a seven to nine year expected life cycle. So um, the neighboring school district is using their cameras right now. They are going on nine years uh, with the cameras. So. Um, it's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had uh, really good things to say when I, I did a site visit to look at the cameras and how they functioned and um, really good things to say about Safely. Again, very responsive. I think that's really huge with a vendor. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that we looked at too here at Lane um, and we, we discussed is the difference between getting either three or five cameras. Um, the two additional cameras would be going on the outside of the bus. Um, Julie, uh, Laura kind of, you know, they explained and I'm assume, I assume <clears throat> that's been the feedback is it's a safety issue, right? I think if we're going to take the time to invest in, in spending cameras, um, the additional cameras on the outside so we can signal again, you know, if somebody wants to run, go around the bus, and it tends to be happening in parking lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lot. that's the feedback that we had, that it's mostly at the beginning of the year and in parking lots, but, um, you know, we can pull that footage and people will be cited um, by law enforcement and then they won't ever go around a school bus with a stop sign pulled out after that. Um, it's, it's just, we want to make sure that um, students are safe on the outside and it will capture the outside of the bus at the bus stop as well. So for the additional uh, it's a little over uh, $15,000 <coughs> um, we get to put those additional cameras on the outside um, which we felt like is a good investment um, you know I would, I would hate to not have invested an extra 15 and something happened on the outside of the bus we had that option but it, it is open for debate so uh, that's our recommendation to the full board Questions? How does the because like the school principals right they review what happens on class? Yes, the administration or their designee. How do how do do they have to physically bring something to them so they can watch it or? Yes. 
Okay. They um, usually what you'll have is more so that you can swap out the drive on the bus. Um, we, we would have to pull the hard drive from the bus. We would have spares so that okay. you know bus takes off the next day. They have something that they're recording on, and then we would pull the footage, um, and we can store that uh, for however long we need it, and then we can put that hard drive back in after. How are we funding this? We. I'm probably, I could shift some other expenses into Medicaid since we have a, a significant Medicaid balance and I could do that. Honestly, I would only do that if our carryover, you know, as we go throughout the year, I thought that we needed to. Um, right now, our special ed expenditures are actually below what we budgeted. I, that, that changes every day. Um, but there's quite a bit of savings there right now. So, but I, I have that to go to. If, Especially with some of our um, you know, our stormwater projects weren't able to be completed uh -huh. because the state wasn't able to <coughs> follow through. So we have savings within the, the budget this year. Any other discussion? Peter, you like that idea? Um, can I get a motion to for the bus cameras for carousel buses? So moved. So you need the motion to how many cameras, right? So I would assume we would need a motion to purchase a safe fleet with five channels for a purchase price of $64,930, correct? Yes. So Stephanie, you, you move that? Yep. All right, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, I'll close none. Motion carries uh, six zero. All right. Thank you, Derek, and more for that. Um, the next one, uh, Julie, you had the uh, right. policy for the cameras. So we wanted to amend the bus policy. We just um, adopted at last the security camera policy. Um, we adopted from the template at the Vermont School Board Association, um, but there were a couple of things that didn't make sense given what we were moving forward with um, with the bus camera purchase. So we did a little research, looked at some other school districts as well. Um, so one of the things we did is that the model policy had said, you know, that audio wouldn't be recorded unless the superintendent approved it. Well, we're approving it because we're purchasing uh, some equipment that will record audio. Um, there's a little more description around, um, you know, the use of cameras in public areas and that, you know, there will be no cameras in areas where a student has an expectation of privacy, like locker rooms or bathrooms, but throughout our school and on our property, we don't necessarily have an expectation of privacy. Um, that they are there to promote order, that we follow our policies. Um, we wanted to make sure that the district will have the capability to maintain any copies that need maintaining for 30 days, which this system will do that. Um, and we wanted to make sure that um, we referenced that the principal and their designee will be those responsible for viewing and um, making decisions about um, video footage. Um. There are no major changes at all. They're just some really some better language that we chose. Uh, I'll make a motion that we can have a discussion. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the F26 security cameras? Have we had this on the agenda previously? Uh, it's oh. not a new policy. It's an amended one. It is on the. It's, it is currently warned. If right. you. But I, I mean, and we probably have every right to take action. I'm just wondering if we should 
you've laid it out that if it would be better to wait until the next meeting to take action so people have a chance to digest it before we approve it? We definitely always do that with a new policy. So if the board wants to do that for this, I'm perfectly happy to do that. I don't think it's going to in any way interfere with our current policy or the installation and purchase of the bus cameras. I don't, but I don't want to surprise anybody that listens or looks at the minutes and says, I didn't realize this was going to happen and it's already approved to give them a chance to review it and say, and if they have an issue with it, they can come to the next meeting or uh, let us know. And then procedurally, just so I'm tracking, uh, amend amendments to procedures don't need a warning, but new It's procedures. still warning. I think it actually, it, as long as a, per, uh, sorry, so we fell back this weekend. I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm stumbling today. Um, an, a policy requires a 10-day warning. The board does not have to do a first reading and then approve it at a later meeting. You can always take action as long as something has been warned for 10 days. However, traditionally <coughs> boards, uh, in, specifically our board, has looked at something twice before adopting it. This is an amendment. It's more than a word. So, you know, when we do our, our Title I comparability policy, we basically <coughs> are changing dates from year to year, and we're, we're just reviewing it and saying, yep, still looks good. That, I feel 100% comfortable encouraging the board to do in a single meeting. This one, to Peter's point, it's a little bit of a change. Okay, so, um, all right, that makes sense. So we could if we wanted to. I have no problem tabling it until next. Um, so you could just make a note, we'll put that for action next one, and then also give the other members who are not here a chance to. Yeah, they won't be installed in the buses before the no. next no. meeting, right? No. So, um, like and our current policy would be fine. Yeah. Doesn't sound like Do there's really too much harm in waiting. Do we actually have uh, a timeline for when they'll be installed? Um, sounds like it'd be a couple weeks before they actually arrive after they're ordered, and then um, really I think it's a bit the availability of Terracell and installing those as the buses come in. And, uh, They'd probably do it over a break. Yeah, most likely over break. So probably sometime in December, maybe. Uh, I think, yeah. Okay. I think it should work over Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so just real quick, Peter. So we will uh, move that action to the mm -hmm. next board meeting. Um, no, I just I should have asked this question uh, earlier, but how many uh, buses are we talking about and is it covering all the buses or will, will we still have some buses that aren't being uh, covered with cameras? It'll be the Terracell buses, the buses serving um, so Swanton and Highgate communities. Okay. All right. <clears throat> all right um, the procedure info, Julie. Right. I just... With this, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a procedure for um, anyone requesting, not anyone, but a parent requesting to view video footage. So in the past, we have not necessarily had the capability of um, or knowledge that we could blur out images of other students. So if we're here at MVU and kids get into a scuffle, um, you know, and a parent says, I really want to see, I don't, you know, I, I, I just want to see that. Um, we have traditionally said no because of student privacy, and it is, and many school districts still have, particularly around bus footage, that the only person who sees that is the administrator um, or their designee making the determination of whether discipline needs to occur. Um, yet, in conversations with our school attorney about something, um, they said, you know, a lot of school districts do have this, and I think that um, it's the most consistent with the federal education, um, 
Family Educational Rights Protection Act, and um, we, Derek and I got together and talked about it, and he said, yes, we have the capability of doing this, but we need to have a procedure. So um, we looked at several districts that have procedures, and it's important in particular that, you know, it's only a parent or guardian making a request. It has to be for a particular reason. You can't just decide you want to look at Christy on the bus next, you know, because so I feel. a parent or guardian of someone on the... Involved, correct. Yeah. So it's, and you're requesting to view footage of your own child. You yeah. don't have the right to have a copy of that footage. Um, you and, and we need time. We need time to be able to make sure that other students can't be identified and that we're protecting their privacy as well. But it, um, a, a, an educational record includes video. If we're keeping the video, then it becomes an educational record. If we're not keeping the video, it's not educational record. So it's not, um, it's not easy. It, it's not as easy as I, you know, I can just call up and say, I want to see that video of that bus today. Um, but there is a process for it. We want to make sure that families understand this. And when we do get the video cameras installed, we'll make sure that it is um, conveyed to parents so that they understand what their rights are around that. So we'll probably be sending copies of these, like emailing. Something. We'll probably be a, a link um, that goes out on Bright Arrow to families so, so that they can see the procedure. To view it with us. Yes. Okay. Because it can't be shared. No. Okay. Good. And we expect that when something is new, then there may be an increased re number of requests. Um, but having worked in a district where this was the practice that slows down. So, so with that, um, Christy Jen, the hope is that this is going to help some of the behaviors and issues and problems, both with students and I think some of the difficulties with the bus company. So, can you put it somewhere on an agenda? Maybe like give us a, what do you think is a good time frame to maybe talk about how it's going and you know, did it create any other problems? Is it smooth sailing and every problem is solved, right? Every problem. You look skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, cameras can help us solve um, mysteries quicker. I, I think that um, in the immediate, sometimes kids are like, oh, there's cameras. And then they forgot about them. Mm -hmm. There's cameras all throughout our building. And the number of times I'm like, there was a camera right there. They're like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. Heat of the moment. So I think that you know, it may or may not be be a, a, a magic deterrent. It won't make things worse. It will That's certainly sure. reduce the amount of time that staff have Absolutely. to take interviewing students yeah. and adults to determine whether something occurred or not. We have to talk to a lot of students mm -hmm. to find out no. if something happened. And if we can look it up, then that just narrows the number of students you want to talk to. So I know um, like when we talk about this with like Yeshua or Chris, um, they really kind of roll out you know, the blessing policies and all that to all the students. Is there, like, any sort of plans to like do that for the for the middle schoolers and the we, high schoolers? We hadn't talked about it before, but I think it makes sense. I think any time we're going to add something different to the way we're going to interact with kids, it makes sense to let them know this is going to be something new on your buses. Fingers crossed. I, I you know, I, it'll be, it certainly will be a help on my end. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion about that procedure? All right. Um, next item is uh, check warrants. <coughs> okay. Uh, accounts payable. We had one million eight hundred seventy thousand fifty-six dollars and six cents. Payroll checks. Fifty-five thousand eight fifty-two eighty-four cents. Um, 
payroll other disbursements one million seven hundred eighty nine thousand six hundred ninety six dollars and forty two cents and payroll deductions seven hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred twenty dollars eighty four cents for a total of four million four hundred eighty seven thousand four hundred twenty six dollars and sixteen cents I'll make the motion to approve those check warrants so moved. all right here is the second all in favor of approving the check warrants as read? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries uh, 6 0. Uh, next item is admin reviews with possible uh, executive, executive session for confidential administration reviews. Right, it would be, it would. Be, I always forget how to say that. I know. How do you, how do you say <laughs> Well, we never do it exactly. Um, we're supposed to make a motion that says we find that it's appropriate for executive session. And then later, when we're ready to go into executive session, we make another motion saying we're ready to go into executive session. So you got to make a We motion always talk about it, but we don't make a motion about it. Twi it's basically you make two motions. So you got to wait, you got to make a motion to make a motion. <laughs> sort of. You're making a motion <laughs> to say it's appropriate You're making to a talk finding. about it. You're making a finding that it's appropriate for executive session, and then later you make a motion to enter executive session for that topic. And do you vote on the finding for that? Or you just make the finding? We have just made the finding. There's, There's a motion you're supposed to You're vote. supposed to really make a motion about it. All right, well, you know what? Let's, let's <laughs> finding to Go an executive session eventually for that. <laughs> you know so it would really be that we are, you know, I, I I'm going to make a, I, I can't, I'm not on the board, but I would make a motion to find that administrative reviews are um, appropriate for exec, should be discussed in executive session due to the confidential nature, and then somebody would say I second that, and then you'd vote, and then we would. And, and about one other item, then we would vote to go into executive session. So I session. what she said. So <laughs> it, um, I'll second that. <laughs> I'm going to need you to repeat it. So the, the thing is, no, okay, but, the, but we're still going to make another motion to go into To it. enter executive yes. session. Okay. All right, so. Sometimes they're right next to each other on the agenda, so right. it blurs. All right. All right, so do we have a fighting to go into executive session for confidential administration? Yes, Purette makes it, Alain seconds it. That it's um, yes. Now the thing is with the finding room, we don't need to vote for them. Oh, we do. Well, we do. We do. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, aye. So, finding. Hold on, Joanne has something to say. <laughs> well, you got you. I just have to be introduced by someone else. No, I just, I just wanted to ask the board out of respect to the three members that are here uh, for the information that's going to be, you know, given in executive session to table this to next week. Can it say that before we did the finding? <laughs> before we well, but now She's you know saying, how to make a finding. It's appropriate for the topic to be in executive sure, session, like but it. Joanne's suggestion is maybe we don't need to do it tonight. Uh, yes, because we are missing three members. It is fine with me. Either way. Yeah, let's table it. Um, you could just move yeah. to the next one, and we'll just stagger the next ones out. Absolutely fine. Thank you, Joanne. That's a great suggestion. Now, do I need to make a motion not to go into it? <laughs> Absolutely not. We've never made a motion to, so it's all right. <laughs> So we don't, and that's why I always put possible executive session because, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that we're predetermining it's appropriate, anything. appropriate, but we're not doing it. <laughs> <That's> nice. <laughs> that's exactly what this is going to say. Did you Should want to talk about budget draft salaries, though? Or no? I, yes. Yes, I do, though. Um, Sorry. Laura's ruining the fun. <laughs> what else is there? Uh, okay, so do we need to change the fine after that, then? But that was never on here. It's not on the agenda, but um, it if the it did come up in our budget conversation that we wanted to perhaps talk about um, negotiations and it's 
connection to this first draft budget. Okay. So if you want to make a finding that, the, well, negotiations conversation is automatically appropriate for executive session. I will make the motion for the finding for executive session to talk about confidential Do information. It. Do it. I don't, I don't know what to put it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, no, it's we, perfectly fine. Right. Um, do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor of uh, possibility for executive sessions for the finding negotiations. Say that clearly. Say aye. 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 All right. Who um, seconded that? Okay. All right. So future agenda items. I know. I know. These are going to be messy next week. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, Swanton continuous improvement team. Some of the teachers on that team are going to talk about that. Um, we had to move the athletic update because they're at the uh, the conference. conference this evening. Um, in December, I believe FFA is going to come, and um, Tanya and the rest of the student services team will be doing a special ed presentation. And of course, there'll be budget. Yeah. And then uh, just real quick, so uh, Dan had mentioned uh, behaviors. That's going to be on the. That'll be in December. December here. Yep. Uh, okay. On my list. Looks good. Uh, our next board meeting is November 19th, 19th uh, at Swanton, uh, Swanton Elementary. Um, anything else? All right. Can I get a motion to enter into executive session? I'll make a motion. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Curated. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Koya, <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Stephanie? Aye. Uh, we will invite in uh, for this Laura, Bonnie, and Julie. That works.